Here's what I tell leaders of organizations. Right now, you have historical project management data. I know you have it, right? It's on SharePoint. It's on, you've got it somewhere. What are you doing with it? What are you doing with it? It's a gold mine that you've done nothing with. That's embarrassing. I mean, run predictive analytics tool, run data mining tools, get some insights into what's going right or what's going wrong on your projects. But where is your data and how are you using it? That's a huge question. Welcome to The Change Lead, the podcast providing leaders with the insight needed to get things done in a rapidly changing and complex world. Subscribe to this podcast so you don't miss an episode. Connect with our community of like-minded leaders on our website, thechangelead.com. Welcome to The Change Lead with your host, Babatope Ipiumi. Are you prepared for a world heavily influenced by AI? Are you prepared to apply artificial intelligence to projects within your organization? Now, artificial intelligence is rapidly changing every aspect of our lives, and the project management office is not immune. So, can we improve the bottom line by applying AI to the project management office? That's my question. To discuss this with me today is Paul Baudreau. Now, Paul is an information systems professional. And he's got over 30 years experience. Paul specializes in AI tools for project management. He's a president of Stone Meadow Consulting. He's also the author of three books focused on AI and project management. So in this episode, Paul and I have a conversation about applying AI to the project management office and how this can improve the bottom line. Hi, Paul. Thanks for joining me today. Really looking forward to our conversation about AI and project management. Hey, I'm happy to be here. Perfect. Um, so in preparation for this conversation, I did what a lot of people are doing now. I went on to ChatGPT <laughs> and I asked ChatGPT, how will ChatGPT impact the world of project management? And I have to say, ChatGPT did a good job of selling itself. I think I'll, I'll read a bit of what it said. It's a bit longer than that. It said, overall, you know, ChatGPT has the potential to make project management more streamlined and effective by making communication and collaboration easier and more efficient. So it's a bit like a good sales job, I must say. Wow. But I'd like to get a professional take <laughs> from <laughs> yourself. <laughs> Not... <laughs> so well, what's your take on it? There's good and bad. There's good and bad with it. So... What people see in ChatGPT is they see this virtual assistant, you know? Oh, I can ask you a question like a Siri or an Alexa, and I get back this amazing answer. What they don't see is what's in the background. Um, GPT, it stands for Generative Pre-trained. It's a pre-trained tool. And what that means is there's AI, there's machine learning in the background, building models, there are, there's natural language processing in the background that's already sorted out a lot of information. So in the background, there's this whole AI structure that really makes it work. And, and it's going to be great for organizations, not right now, but once they start into the business environment, what you will do is take chat, chat GPT, attach your organization's database to it, and then ask it questions. So for example, you, you attach your uh, project history, your project data, and then ask questions about that data. And it goes through and does all of the, the machine learning calculations and comes back with some good answers. So it needs to be more specific because it's too generic right now. The other issues, it's okay. not always accurate. It's, it can give terrible <laughs> answers sometimes. It's called hallucinations. Hallucinations in ChatGPT means it goes off the deep end and answers like something that makes absolutely no sense. So we have to do some benchmarking around it to make sure it's going to work effectively for organizations. Interesting. Interesting. I think, like, like you said, it's the people are seeing the front end. They're not seeing the engine behind. They're not seeing the workings behind. Um, and I think be, what's probably getting everybody's attention, is, it's, it's almost like that human nature People are seeing it's becoming behavior is human-like. That unpredictability 
the ability yeah. to hallucinate as well. It's yeah. it's, a, it's a little we're bit so of that. Good at, so aren't we good at this? Like human. Yeah, we're very good at this. You know, we we try and make things like human. Like um, I don't know when when you were a child, you had a little teddy bear and you pressed the belly and it said, "I love you, Babs." Right? It's because we're just attracted to this this these inanimate objects that we we try and make more human like. Okay, interesting. So on that more human note, it would be good to get a little bit about your journey. So you've you've got this up. You've, wait, you're in this position whereby you're in project management AI. As in, how how can you talk to your journey? How did you get to do two very exciting things? I must say. How did I get where I am today? <laughs> okay, well you know <laughs> I've been a project manager for a long time. Uh, over 30 years, mainly in technology industry, but I've done some infrastructure project management as well. Um, yeah, I have PMP certification, you know, uh, but I've always been fascinating, uh, fascinated. I've always been fascinated with new technology. And so when AI started to become more, more prevalent, then I thought, well, how, how can I use this to improve project management, to improve the thing that I'm really working on? And I have a bit of a coding background. I'm not great, but I can do some programming. And I program in Python. And I started by opening up a Python, which is open source, and coding some machine learning applications. And I said, well, OK, if I want to do this in RISC, how can I apply this? If I want to do um, uh, something else, if I want to do a prediction on a project, how can I apply this? So that's really how I got into AI. I started by actually being hands-on, working hands-on in it. Okay, that's nice. And I think it, it speaks a lot to that non-linear nature of, of, of humanity, really. It's, it's not really one thing naturally, so that you've, you've pulled things together, taken yes. a juncture, and moved on. Um, honestly, I'm going to sound like a simple question, but I'll tell you where I'm coming from here. So before this conversation, I was telling people, I'm looking forward to speaking to you, actually. <laughs> this is going to be interesting to speak about AI and project management. And one friend I was speaking to, he said, yeah, you know, AI, it's this thing, everybody, every company says they're doing it, but are they really doing AI? So I always want to take a step back and say, okay, what is AI? Good question. Good question. Because a lot of people who think they know what AI is are, are not really doing AI. You're correct. Um, so there's, first of all, there's no common definition. That's the problem. Uh, people can't agree on a single definition for AI. So it's got these funny kind of boundaries. However, what I do is I, instead of trying to define it, I describe it. And at its core, AI is a software program. It's a software program that uses math and statistics, and it uses calculus. Remember calculus? So what it does is it takes data and it correlates data into a model. This is what the data represents. And from that model of what the data represents, it, it, uh, it, it can make predictions. It can help you make decisions. Um, what I say is AI is based on math, not myth. Hey, you can quote me on that. So <laughs> there are two main capabilities <laughs> for AI, two main capabilities. Uh, prediction and classification. And they sound very simple, but a lot of very clever people have discovered innovative ways to use these. And we'll probably talk about some of them as we, as we go through this. Okay, in in interesting. Um, so I think I, I like that fact that you're describing AI. I like that quote. It's based on math, not myth. So I think I'll... I'll, I'll I'll write that one up. I, I really like my codes as well. Um, something you've already touched on, I think you touched on from the beginning, from your journey, from how pro, um, AI is going to impact project management is about data. You talked about an organization hooking up a database to the AI and ability to, to ask AI questions once they hook it up. Um, can you speak to that a little bit, the importance of data? And how do we begin to make the most of the data we have or... We, we don't have, how do we capture the data? We do, yeah, how, that's how do you make another, most of data? Yeah, that's another great question. Thanks. Um, so listen, first of all, yeah, data, people have a misunderstanding again about AI that you need massive amounts of data. 
that's not necessarily true. Um, if you're if you're doing AI, for example, in the medical field, uh, brain scans, uh, pneumonia in children under two, and you want to check those images, then yes, I would say you need th those organizations are collecting lots and lots of data. In the business world, I was at a presentation with a professor, a local professor who said he builds AI models based on 50 data sets. So we don't need massive amounts of data in project management, but we need a reasonable amount of data. <clears throat> and the data sets need to have a lot of characteristics in them. Now, um, <clears throat> the other thing with data is some AI doesn't need a lot of data at all. So for example, genetic algorithms, or even something called unsupervised learning in the machine learning world, um, you can just take, for example, you take a risk and you identify characteristics of all the risks in your risk register, and you can do something called classification or grouping of the risks, all right? Um, but I wanna get to the single most important thing about data, okay? The single most important thing about data, we've changed the world of software. AI has reversed the world of software. So here's what we used to do with software. We would look at what needs to be done and we create logic for every single thing. Oh, if this happens, remember if statements for any programmers out there, if this yep. happens, we're gonna do this. If this happens, do this. And we code every single logical uh, possibility. And we end up with thousands, tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands, millions of lines of code. But now, what we do is we code a neural network. Um, we can code a neural network in maybe 10, 12, 20 lines of code. And what it does is it takes the data and it makes the data create a model. And from there, we make a decision. So the logic is no longer hard coded into the software. The logic is based on what the data says. We're now making decisions directly from the data instead of this hard-coded logic in software. So data has completely reversed the way we think about software. That's why it is so important. Interesting. If, if I follow that thread, so if, if we're now taking the data and reversed it, so data is driving the logic effectively. Yes. What happens when you have an outlier? Well, how now, how now does the AI deal about, with that? Yes, now we're talking about math and not myth. So how do you deal with outliers? That's one of the questions. How do we statistically deal with an outlier? Um, you can incorporate it into your data. You can ignore it. Uh, this is why project managers are going to have to understand a little bit more about statistics. Maybe if you ignore it and you get a prediction that's, that's rated at a 98% probability, you don't need it. It was truly an outlier. You investigated it. It wasn't part of the, the normal uh, correlation. Maybe outliers are part of a trend. So you have one outlier now, then you have another outlier, then you have another one. So now you need to adjust your model. But when we're talking about data, um, I could go on all day about um, data wrangling, which is getting the right data, collecting the right data, making sure it's available, making sure it's accurate. Um, I could talk about feature engineering, which is talking about data that's going to give you a causal correlation and not just a coincidence or a random uh, correlation. Uh, so data is very important. As project managers, we have to understand uh, the data and how it impacts the results we're going to get. OK, I, I like that. So and even if you have an outlier, as long as the model is effectively the model is a living model. So it takes the data yes. and is updating it. You're updating the model based on, based on the data. OK, um, something else I've heard terms that maybe help with this. So you've used the word database already, and we know that that's really structured data. I've read the term data lake used in this context as well. Could you, yes. could you talk on that, probably bring some clarity into that? Because is there one that's right for purpose or not? Um, so you're getting a little bit outside my area of expertise. I'm not a data scientist or a data engineer. But what organizations are doing is they're, they're starting to pool their data. Or, or create larger, instead of a, a, a number of databases that are interfaced, they pool their data and put it into a larger database so it's more easily accessible. And within that database, they run tools that make sure the data is um, accurate, 
uh, they make sure the data is, um, you know, in feature engineering, they make sure that it's not two data fields means the same thing. Um, you could have one data field that you have no idea what it means. Uh, if you have it in a data lake, right, you, you just have all the data in one area, it's more easy to manage as opposed to interfacing to several different databases. Got it. Okay. All right. Understood. Um, I think it would be always good to have examples. I think examples bring a lot of these concepts to life, um, particularly with, within project management and PM, PMO office. There's a, there's a particular time of the year, everybody starts thinking, okay, looking at budgets, how do you determine which project is going to be successful or not? Can you talk through examples of how people have successfully used AI to predict uh, and ensure the success of projects? Uh, okay, so we're talking about how, how AI is helping uh, helping project project managers do this, and um, the first thing is um, um, making documents more accurate. For example, uh, what I call honesty in documentation. You've got your scope statement, you got your schedule, you got your risk plan, maybe even your quality plan. It's bringing a higher level of quality into the documentation, um, and and. Finding errors and omissions earlier yeah, is better. It, you may say, well, yeah, but it doesn't cost much different, but it, it really does. It, it has an impact on, on all sorts of things like um, keeping your team motivated. I mean, if the teams work on, on, on the project for three months and all of a sudden they found an error that was due to some mistake in the scope document, it's pretty frustrating. So you were talking about examples. And I want to talk about um, how to make projects successful. And I'm going to use an example here. So what we do is we take, we take historical projects, we take historical projects and identify whether they've been successful or not. And, and I want to use this example. Think of it as an image. Think of it as an image. And you have an image of a dog, okay? And a, a, the image of the dog means the project is successful. And then you have an image of a cat. And the image of the cat means the project is not successful. And I apologize to cat lovers, okay? <laughs> I have two cats. So now what you do, as I said, you build a model with your project, your project documentation that you haven't started yet. You have your scope statement, your, your schedule, you have all sorts of characteristics, you have stakeholder um, uh, management, communication management. So you use all the project's characteristics and then you build that model with the data from that project. And you say, does this look more like a dog or more like a cat? So now you say, okay, I've got an image that looks um, pretty much like a dog, but, but only maybe 80%. Okay, now let's go back and fix, let's go back and fix the things that we need to fix. And there are organizations around the world that are doing this. It is still early in the game. Um, I've been working with, uh, I just finished a contract with the Canadian government I have been working with three Canadian government departments uh, on improving project success, and it is happening. And, and so, I mean, listen, if governments can do it, I have no idea why private organizations can't do it. Um, when the governments do it, do a project, and this is true in Canada, they had a big project a, a number of years ago, and it was a disaster. What happens when the government has a disastrous project? Front page, <laughs> front page, it's like a tabloid, <laughs> right? Here we go. You wasted all of our taxpayers' money. Now they have a new project, okay? It's similar to the other project. What do they do? Hey, Paul, um, you got any AI tools that can help me fix this? Because I don't want to be in the front page of that tabloid again. And that's where I talk about what they're doing now is making their documents more accurate. Um, I've worked with a multinational company in Germany, um, and they wanted to focus on risk management. How do we improve our risk management plan in our, in our sites, in, in one of our sites that took it on? They're doing a pilot project for that. And there are ways that we can um, improve the probability and uh, impact assessment on risks. Although I don't know if you want to get into this right away. So for risks, I have a completely different concept. Okay. My concept on risk is that risks are binary. Okay. Binary one or zero. They either, either happen or they don't happen. 
Okay. We're doing risk management all wrong. We're doing risk management from the 1980s. We need to update our risk management philosophy. Risks are binary. I'm right. And I can prove it to you. At the end of a project, you take your risk register. Look at the risks. They either happened or they didn't happen. Right? So they were either 100% or zero. So we know that risks are binary. What we have to do is take that concept from the end of the project and move it to the beginning of the project. So now we say at the beginning of the project, let's gather the data, let's run our machine learning tools, let's do clustering, let's do prediction, let's do classification. And then we say the probability of this risk is going to be 100% included in the scope. Probability of this risk is going to be zero. Okay, ignore it. So we've completely disrupted the way people think about uh, about risks. Right now, a lot of our risks is based on human judgment. It's very subjective. And even that I was just reading a paper on fuzzy logic tools where what they do is they have these mathematical models that help um, uh, quantify categorical data. So categorical data like low, medium and high, because as humans, we can't put a number to it. So we say low, medium and high. Listen, we've got to get rid of that thinking. These mathematical models, models don't work. We need machine learning tools and we need AI to change the way that we manage risks. And that is making organizations more successful. We don't have to be 100% perfect. This is what, this is what, <laughs> oh, another pet peeve. Here we go. You know, people say, people say, um, I don't want to use the technology because it's not perfect. It doesn't have to be perfect. It only has to be better than you. <laughs> so, for example, um, I guess, uh, yeah, uh, an example would be self-driving cars, right? Self-driving car gets in an accident. Oh, we can't use self-driving cars on the road. Um, if we had self-driving cars, if every single car on the road was self-driving, accidents would be reduced by 90%. Right. So when we talk about using AI and project management, let's get over this concept that, oh, no, it has to be perfect. No, it doesn't. We don't have to eliminate all risks. We don't have to make all risks binary. But let's take our risk register that has 100 risks in it and reduce that to 10 or 12. Wouldn't that be amazing? Wouldn't that be amazing? Yeah. Babs, I have solutions. It's for a you. very interesting take on the risk register. No, so I'm, 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 this is the first I've heard of that concept. So I'm, I'm just, my, my head is a bit, spinning a little bit with that. It's my concept. That reinforced that. bias. Sorry? I think it's, it's a brilliant concept. So I'm, I'm, it's a brilliant concept. Could, could that reinforce bias? So if you oh. don't have a massive data set, you don't have... <laughs> You're jumping all you over the place this. here. You're jumping all over the place here. So... <laughs> Are there ethical issues in AI? Absolutely. There are ethical issues all over the place. Now, because we're not that far along in project management yet, uh, we've managed to keep it under control. But organizations have to think about ethics. They have to think about bias in the data. They have to think about um, algorithms that aren't working properly. They have to think about poor interpretation because people don't have enough statistical knowledge. They have to think about proper feature engineering and causal correlation. There's all sorts of ethical issues. And what's happening in organizations, and I won't say project organizations, okay, not yet. Organizations are using AI and they don't have ethical governance. They don't have ethics training in AI, which I've just created a course on. And so what's going to happen is it's, it's, like a, it's like a scandal waiting to break open. And so a year, two years from now, an organization is going to have made a policy decision based on a machine learning tool. And it's going to create a scandal because someone is going to look into it and say, well, wait a minute, look what you've done. You know, this person is, you know, you, you didn't use this, you didn't do that. And it's going to be a huge scandal. And that's not the issue. The issue is they're going to ask them, what were you doing about it? What's your ethics governance on this? Do you have anybody trained in ethics? And they're going to go, uh, uh, let me call Paul. See what's, see what I got. maybe he can help. No, it's too late. 
so in project management, in project management, I do have, um, I have been working on ethics uh, in AI. And this was one of the things I just finished with the government of Canada. They wanted an AI skills development program. And one of the things we talked about was governance around ethical issues that are going to come up. Okay, interesting. So, so, so that's that's good. Um, so I, I, you're right. It's not the technology; it's the it's the company itself that needs to have be an ethical company, have the right policies in place, have, have the right yeah. leadership and behaviors in place for for that to be. Um, I think you've already touched on this, but probably I want to go a bit deeper in terms of how this can impact the bottom line. I think you've, you've written a book on, on this already. How you know, apply AI to the PMO can yeah. improve the bottom line. So a lot of yeah. people, a lot of leaders are really focused on costs. And it's one of the things yes. that probably drive adoption early on is we can see the cost benefit. Can, can you talk to that a little bit? Sure. Uh, so I talked about accuracy and documentation. That would be my first step in any project, especially for a large organization. Um, you know what? The cost of these tools is very minimal. It's like, you know what software is, you know, you buy a license and you pay per use and things like that. So the value in, in you know, paying to find errors is like 10 to 100 times the cost of what that tool is. So in other words, you know, you pay $100, you get $1,000 in value from it. Okay, it's reduced your cost. You pay $100, you reduce your cost by 1000. Something like the, the cost of quality, right? We have a cost for quality, but the benefit is enormous. Um, other other ways to save money in projects, um, assigning resources. So uh, if you think about it, and I'll use another example. Um, right now, there are AI tools that screen resumes, right? They use natural language processing. Mm -hmm. Somebody is applying to an organization. Um, the, 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 the tool goes through and says, oh, yeah, you've got all these words and phrases, and it screens them in to the next stage, right? That is developing even more uh, in more detail. And I think what we can use that for in project management is matching resources and matching resource skills and experience to the tasks that are required on the project. So we no longer have to worry about, oh, yeah, uh, can you do this? Yep, okay, well, let's be more specific in it. And there is an organization that's doing that right now in Europe uh, at the portfolio level. So they're looking at resources and assigning resources based on skill sets that's in place. I'm, I'm not mentioning any um, software vendors because I didn't want to get into it in case people think I'm getting a commission. I'm not, okay? But there is a software vendor in Europe. Um, if people contact me, I'll let them know who it is. But I just don't want to get into talking about all the vendors that are available. And there are many vendors available doing this stuff. Uh, the other thing is optimization of things like schedule crashing. You've got an issue on your project. You have to do schedule crash, crashing. And we do some of this little math stuff now. And you know what we do? We hope. We hope it works. We've done a calculation for, for the money I'm putting in. This is the best result. Come on. Come on. Use AI tools. Use machine learning. Predict that this is going to be successful. And the most important one, and I'll, I'll kind of finish off on this one, is have you heard about lean project management? Lean project management. If we talk about it from a resource point of view, we're bringing in resources who are perfectly qualified to do the work. We need somebody who's got five years experience. We're not going to hire somebody who's got 25 years experience and have to pay them more. Lean project management, the just-in-time technique. Okay, let's order this material for the project. Let's, um, you know, we've got the... Um, uh, the, the scheduling mechanism, you know, we've got all these interdependent tasks. When do we do this? When do we have to have the resource in place? And <laughs> if we use a just in time technique on project management now, poof, <laughs> you know what happens in projects, right? What's the famous saying? My project was perfect until it started and then all heck broke loose. So we can't really do lean project management now, but with AI, you can. And again, it's not going to be perfect. And this is going to allow us to reduce costs by being able to schedule things more accurately with, with the ability to know that that's going to happen when it's supposed to happen with more confidence, okay? So I think lean project management and that whole concept 
um, is going to take off once we get AI tools uh, more pervasive throughout project management. And that will definitely reduce costs. Yeah, it's interesting. So there are a lot of things from you explain. Of, there's a lot of opportunity, a lot of improvements that can be made by applying AI. If you look five, ten years into the future, maybe we don't need to look that far. What does the future project manager look like? Um, project managers. What's the project the man <laughs> Yeah, sorry. Um, project managers need to collaborate with AI tools. Okay. Uh, this isn't, I, I did write a book that's called the self-driving project where I said, you don't need a project manager, just do it. Uh, that was a bit of a research exercise to, to see if I could, you know, extend the boundaries and challenge people, challenge people's beliefs. You don't challenge people by say, let's, by saying, let's do it the same old way. You challenge people by saying, Hey, look, we could do all of this without a project manager. I didn't mean it. What I meant was we have to collaborate. Project managers have to collaborate with AI to be successful. Project managers have to improve their skills in data management. We talked about it. A bit of data wrangling, a bit of feature engineering. Do you think the IT group is going to do that? They don't know project management. They don't know what those data fields mean, right? And what about, what about statistics? Project managers are going to have to know a little bit more about statistics because you have to interpret the results. What does it mean? It's easy, 98% probability, oh, that's easy. What if it's 65%? What if it's 75, what do you do? Do you go back and do some feature engineering? Do you look for, maybe you haven't got the right causal correlations? You have to know a little bit, you do not need to hire a master's degree in statistics to do it. But if a project manager can start improving their knowledge of math and statistics, they're going to be extremely valuable. Look, do you know what they're paying data scientists these days? A lot, a lot. So now what we, we're going to migrate to is project managers who collaborate with AI because they know the basics and the background of how they work. They can understand data and do a bit of data management. They understand statistics and can interpret the results. So their value is going to skyrocket. Those are the project managers that, that organizations want to hire. Um, you know, if they don't, they're going to have to hire a data scientist. They're going to have to hire a project coordinator. They're going to have to hire. So why hire three or four different people to make your project successful? Hire a project manager who can do all these things. The other thing project managers have to do is change management will become huge. I mean, it already is, right? And project managers already have to do it. I don't talk about it a lot because it already exists, but it will become more important for a project manager. And I think they're gonna spend more time on it. And last but not least, something we already touched on, and that is ethical issues. Project managers are gonna to have to look at data that's being used, project team data. Is there bias in that data? Um, is there, was there informed consent to use that data? Uh, there's all sorts of ethical issues. And, you know, how do I store that data? Who do I share that data with? You know, uh, so again, the project manager is going to have to understand that. So, yeah, we still have a project manager. Project manager still has a lot of responsibilities. But doesn't it sound exciting? <laughs> It definitely, it definitely sounds very exciting. It's a big step up from what a lot of people expect today from a project manager, but it's definitely exciting. A lot of opportunities and a lot of value bringing it comes very central to um, the organization of the future, really. Um, yes. uh, one question I want to ask, and it's almost like a question, if I knew the right question to ask, if you are a leader and a leader was looking to apply AI to the organization, what question would they be asking themselves? Are you ready? How soon can I get started? Okay. Where's my project data? And how do I create a training program for my organization? Let's go through the and review these. How soon can I, can I get started? Uh, Babs, this is a competitive advantage. You, you just talked about it. There's value in this. There's value. And so um, 
if your organization has many projects and you are not on board with it, you're just skeptical. Another organization, your competitor says, we've got to do this. We're going to use AI to make sure we've got accurate uh, documents. We're going to use AI for resources. We're going to use AI for our risk registers. Which organization do you think is going to be more competitive? Right? You got a smile. I can see that. Second thing is, where is my project data? Um, it's got to be structured. It's got to be available. And here's what I talk. I do presentations to organizations. As a matter of fact, I'm doing one, I think, I'm doing one in June to industry leaders uh, <laughs> in Australia. So here's what I tell leaders of organizations. Right now, you have historical project management data. I know you have it right? It's on SharePoint. It's on, you've got it somewhere. What are you doing with it? What are you doing with it? It's a gold mine that you've done nothing with. That's embarrassing. I mean, run predictive analytics tool, run data mining tools, get some insights into what's going right or what's going wrong on your projects. But where is your data and how are you using it? That's a huge question. As I said, it's gold, but you're not digging for it. Get started. Uh, last one, how do I create a training program for my organization? Um, give me a call. <laughs> I'll give you help. But we talked, about, we talked about the skills that project managers need. Um, so they do have to be trained in project management. You do have to know uh, you do have to know project management. You have to know the basics in the background. Um, and all of the things I talked about, um, these courses are available in different places. Uh, um, Coursera, uh, different universities have uh, professional development courses. Um, there's stuff on LinkedIn Learning uh, that you can you can do. There's stuff on YouTube. There's some courses if you're in if you find the right person on YouTube. Uh, I found some very valuable courses in machine learning on YouTube. Um, so for project managers, I would say there's no there's no obstacle to getting started other than time if you're busy. Um, and to organizations, I think you need to put something together and maybe create like a certif certification program or a levels of knowledge. Uh, as we talked about, project managers are gonna provide a lot of value. And how do you judge how much they know and how valuable they are to your organization? So we have PMP. Um, maybe we need to have something called an AI maturity level in organizations. That's another concept. I'm sorry, I'm giving away free all my new concepts. Uh, in software, we have a capability maturity model. Uh, Paul is just inventing and working on something called an AI maturity model for organizations. Um, so yeah, those would be the main questions I ask. You know, how do I get started? How do I get moving? And there are vendors. Hey, listen, go ask a vendor for a, for a demo. They'll they'll give you a demo. I guarantee it. Yeah. Right. And if they don't, give me a call. I think <laughs> I know most of them. <laughs> yeah, exactly, Alex. I know you said it jokingly, but I think on on serious note, if they give you a call, as in you, you've got a. I've listened to a bit, a lot of your content, so I know you, 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 you're right up, right up there with with understanding this. Um, I think you, you've shared so much. You've given a lot of nuggets for free. Um, it would be good to get a bit of insight on who you are. So, just in closing, can you share a little bit about yourself? Who is Paul? Um, Who is Paul? Anything interesting you're doing right now? And I think probably most interesting and most importantly, how can people reach out to you as well? Sure. Um, so I am Professor Paul. I teach uh, currently at a college in Canada. I also teach, I teach an AI for project management course, applying AI to, pro AI to project management at a business school in Europe. I uh, just finished doing that, uh, ended in April. And um I love, I love uh, teaching. I love investigating new concepts. Uh, so I'm doing research. I continue my research in AI. I'm doing research around chat GPT capabilities. I'm doing research around um, uh, unsupervised learning or classification and how we can apply that to project management. Uh, I have someone in Europe I'm also working with in terms of the PMO and how you can determine which projects out of many projects which project is, is really delivering the most value and which project should probably not be on your list of to-dos right now. So there's that. In terms of reaching out, hey, listen, uh, project managers, one of the best things you can do 
I do have some books out. Okay, sorry, I did a promo there. Here's my suggestion. Don't buy my book. Go to your organization. Go to the training department and say, hey, listen, Paul's got some books out there. Let's buy five or six copies and share them throughout the organization. That's my suggestion. Okay. Now, if you want to buy it, go ahead and buy it. I'd be very happy. I don't make a lot of money off these books. I do try and fund some of my research out of, out of what I receive from the royalties, but trust me, it's not that much. There's 16 million project managers in the world. And, uh, <laughs> yeah, not, not for my sales. <laughs> um, in terms of reaching out to me, listen, I'm active on LinkedIn. Uh, so just type my name in and, uh, you should probably see my, my picture and connect with me. I'm happy to connect with people. Um, um, you can check on Amazon. If you go into your local Amazon type, again, type my name in and look for my books and you'll see a connection to me there. I've got an author page set up there as well. Um, or you can send me an email. I don't mind getting emails. P B O U D R six one three at gmail.com. Uh, I'm happy to answer questions. I'm quite busy right now. As I said, I just finished a government contract. I just got an email uh, this morning from another government department that wants to work with me. Um, and I've got a couple of, uh, I, I've got another course. So someone in the U.S. now wants to uh, create and deliver a course based on my books, AI and project management. So I will be helping out uh, that program. It's a master's program in project management and IT, I believe. So they will be um, uh, looking to to you know, get some of the knowledge that I have and, and share that uh, through there. Plus, uh, you know, I continue doing research and work with, uh, with the university. So kind of a, kind of a busy time, hopefully not so busy during the summer. I want to enjoy the weather, but, but uh, always happy, always happy to talk to people. Emails are, are, if I get back to you within the day, it means I'm doing great. If I don't get back to you within three or four days means I'm really Really, really busy. Don't panic. Yeah, I think you clearly sound very busy. Um, given how busy you are, I think it's a privilege to have the opportunity to speak with you. Well, I'll also make sure I put the links to your LinkedIn profile, your Amazon author page. I'll put that in the show notes. So people through the, you know, if you're watching this, if it's on YouTube, you'll be in the description. Uh, and if you're listening to this podcast, just go to the description. You'll find the links to reach out to Paul. Um, Paul, you've shared a lot of insights. You've shared your passion about this as well, which is quite interesting to see technology, AI, project management with passion. So that is that is brilliant. Thanks so much for your time. Thanks for taking time to speak to me. Thank you very much. Uh, thanks, babe. I, babe, babe. Babs, Babs, thank you so much. I enjoyed it. Um, and I hope uh, everyone out there takes some value from this and continues to move along their career and thinks about uh, using AI to bring more value to their projects and their organizations. Thank you. Thanks for tuning into my conversation with Paul. Now, I have certainly learned more about AI and how applying AI to the PMO can improve the bottom line. If this episode was of value to you, please consider leaving a review wherever you get your podcast. I'd like to invite you to continue the conversation on our community website, thechangelead.com. On the community website, we have a platform where you can share and discuss the challenges of leadership and change with fellow professionals. So visit the, the website today, thechangelead.com. Would you also like to connect with Paul, today's guest? You can find his details in the show notes. Now, if you go to the description section, you can get links to his LinkedIn profile and his Amazon author page. Also, finally, please don't forget to comment, review and subscribe. Thank you very much for tuning in today. Have a good rest of your day and see you next time.